enter the main lobby of our building, on the right wall is the agency's motto. And it's from the book of John. And it says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And that really is quite simply and fundamentally what CIA does each and every day. The CIA really consists of four basic administrative uh, areas. Three of them are totally overt. And most all of the people work in the agency headquarters building. And they have basically normal lives. Was this threat still? You're asking me a direct question? Yes. The smallest part of the agency, which in our parlance is the clandestine service, it's where I've spent my entire career. Our work is not in headquarters. We don't commute into an office every day. We live and work and spend our entire lives scattered all over the face of this planet, uh, trying to find out the plans and intentions of bad people before they can carry those out and harm U.S. national security interests or uh, U.S. lives. Matt Damon's character Jason in the movie would be a field operations officer. Jason would have been trained in uh, self-defense, uh, weapons handling, high-speed driving, disguise, secret writing, communications. He will be taught as we are an entire array of what we collectively call the tradecraft skills. The best plan invariably turns to chaos. And a good ops officer never breaks stride, even when everything around them is coming apart. And it can be very, very challenging at times. I come in here, and the first thing I'm doing is I'm catching the sight lines and looking for an exit. I really enjoyed the scene in the diner when Jason's telling Marie he, he doesn't know who he is, but he knows that he can name the license plates. Of all six cars outside. The clothing people are wearing. I can tell you that our waitress is left-handed, and the guy sitting up at the counter weighs 215 pounds and knows how to handle himself. Now, why would I know that? Well, that's because it's truly second nature as an ops officer to be highly cognizant uh, and attentive to your environment and people around you. You are taught and you do work on being able to scan a room and then leave that room and sit down and sketch how it was laid out, the titles of the books, uh, you know, the clothing that people were wearing. You need to be very, very attentive, very, very observant. And Jason knows that he's doing that. He just doesn't know why at that point because he's still struggling to try to get his memory back. I like the, you know, the fact that the chase scene was not some souped up high performance car with flames painted on the side that was spinning rubber and his little red car that was bouncing downstairs. That's pretty much how that would work. You know, you're driving a car and oh my god, you gotta go someplace and you bang down the stairs. You know, you try to escape. He was doing everything in a very ordinary, linear, non-high-tech way. Because that's pretty much how it worked. There's a saying that in the hands of a master, hey. anything can become a weapon. The more trained you are with weaponry and survival skills, the more you'll be able to rely on it when and if crisis situations occur and you have to improvise, modify, adapt, and overcome. And you see that with the fight scene where Boren simply picks up a ballpoint pen off the desk and uses it as a field expedient improvised weapon. And you can cause serious damage. And I like that scene very much because that was quite realistic. Actual fighting comes down to some pretty crude grappling, and you saw that with Boren. And everything was linear and straight, and it was over quickly, which is how that kind of fighting really takes place. You should never have come here. I, these children, if that's not going to happen. 
I have to tell you, as an agency officer, I mean, I totally applaud the, the idea of Jason Bourne's training and the wonderful line of demarcation between his hard, extraordinary operational side and his quite uh, compassionate, ordinary human side. But in the end, the movie was really quite a thrill ride and, and, and really well done. chase sequence is um, our man that gets in and out of everything because of his ability to do things. It's exciting and stimulating, yet it's almost humorous how this little Mini Cooper that could got through this whole labyrinth of problems with the police and whatnot. This was a dilapidated, funky car that could hardly drive down the street, much less uh, involve itself in a, a major uh, hysterical race. I think it would surprise people to know that the sound in this scene was 99% created. All the car motor sounds, uh, the motorcycles, the sirens, the horns, the bus, everything was created. Roll set. Rolling. And action. I think the misconception that the audience have is what we work very hard for them to get. You see a scene and you figure they filmed it with a camera and a microphone was hanging next to it, and this is what it was. Most people don't know, but when they shoot the film, they mic it for pretty much just the voices. The car chase sequence in Born Identity was photographed very well. It was cut together very well, and it, it lent itself to a very exciting sequence sonically. <laughs> The Mini itself needed to sound like it was pushed to its ultimate limits, but not be overpowering. We started with the sound of the Mini Cooper, which unfortunately is not a uh, terribly dynamic sound. It, it works pretty well, but we found in cutting it, it didn't have enough excitement and forward momentum. So I took a motorcycle and I pitched it down so it would sound more like in the Mini Cooper range to make the motor more exciting and to give you more a sense of speed and danger. As the chase goes along, the car kind of breaks down more and more and we try to capture its push to the limit all the way through. To make it sound rougher, I took an old beat up Cadillac with a couple spark plugs pulled off the motor so it would miss, you know, so when you accelerate it had that chug, 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 chug sound. Took that and pitched it up. Motorcycle came down, Cadillac came up, meeting the Mini Cooper in the middle, and basically those are the three main elements to create the sound of the Mini Cooper throughout the chase. I'd say we had, in our cutting room, maybe a scene like this, a thousand tracks. When we start. Born identity, sound feature, fully. We have to take it bit by bit and choose, does this skid work with that lady screaming? Does this, this skid work with that engine rev? Does this gear grind work with the suspension ronk? Because sometimes it gets monotonous and you try to keep everything interesting and stimulating. That one by is just swinging though, isn't it? Oh yeah. Boom. It's all done in kind of layers, so we can put it together as we go, and we can kind of see how it's coming together as well. It's very rewarding for us to be at this end of the process, because when you see it all come together, um, it's exciting, and even the filmmakers get excited. Now that you know a little bit about us, and what we do and what we go through in the sound process, you can also play around with our sound elements in the following interactive menu.